Martin, and I'm one of the medical oncologists with Blue Ridge Cancer Care. I was asked to talk to you today about breast cancer and would like to give you an overview of breast cancer care from the time of diagnosis through your treatment. I'm going to focus mostly on the systemic therapy, which is chemotherapy or oral medications that are taken, um, as that's my area of expertise. Most important starting point is a mammogram. Mammograms should be done yearly. Uh, there were some task forces looking at mammograms being done every other year, but generally speaking, most people recommend a yearly mammogram. A screening mammogram is just that yearly mammogram when you've not felt anything abnormal and you're just doing your due diligence to go and have a mammogram. If you have a mammogram that's abnormal, you'll then be referred for a diagnostic mammogram, which is a bit more in depth. And this is usually coupled with an ultrasound. If you actually feel a mass before you go in for your mammogram, if you alert your physician to the fact that you can actually feel something, you will go straight to a diagnostic mammogram. And anyone who has an abnormal mammogram, a biopsy is then recommended and is usually done through the radiology department with ultrasound guidance. When a diagnosis of cancer is made, a surgical consult is recommended with one of the breast surgeons. Now, some of the breast surgeons are going to recommend an MRI as this will help them to better evaluate the extent of disease to assure that when they do their surgery that all the margins will be clear and to assure that they have removed all the cancer. This is not recommended in everybody, so this is a decision that is discussed with your surgeon. Oftentimes, genetics are also recommended either before or after surgery, and we'll get into some details about that later. Staging is an important aspect of breast cancer, and I think the easy way to remember this is any involved lymph nodes brings you up to a stage two or three, depending on the number of lymph nodes involved, and anything over a two centimeter size will also put you into a stage two category. And once they get considerably larger or skin involvement or ulceration, this gives you a higher stage of cancer. When you meet with a surgeon, you will discuss different surgical options, which would include a lumpectomy or what we call breast conserving therapy versus a mastectomy, which is removal of the entire breast. They would also discuss with you the role of sampling your lymph nodes to assess whether the cancer has spread into the lymph nodes. Other discussion will include whether surgery should occur first or after additional therapy. Briefly touching on the role of radiation, radiation is generally recommended for most, but not all, if you have breast conserving therapy or a lumpectomy. There is, however, a role for radiation after a mastectomy, depending on the size of the cancer and depending on the nodal status. Most recently, there's been plenty of data looking at avoidance of radiation in certain patients who have very low risk, small breast cancers, node negative over the age of 70. And that's a new recommendation that has recently come about over the past few years. With regards to systemic therapy, what we're talking about is any medical therapy. This can include endocrine therapy, otherwise known as hormone therapy, versus chemotherapy. And now with some new recommendations that are therapy and targeted therapy, of which I will talk about in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. The pathology of breast cancer is critically important. We used to think that the size was the most important finding, and it's not. The most important thing about your breast cancer is the actual pathology, or what we say, the biology of your cancer. The most common type of breast cancer is called ductal or invasive ductal cancer. The next most common would be a lobular cancer. There are other types of cancer that are a bit more rare that I won't get into today. The more important feature of your cancer is the receptor status on the cancer cells. The three 
typical receptors that we test for at the time of the biopsy include estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, and HER2 new receptors. HER2 new receptors indicate a mutation that has occurred in the cancer cell that makes these cancer cells very aggressive. HER2 new positive cancers almost irregardless of the size or nodal status are going to need to see chemotherapy because these are aggressive cancers that will recur or have a much higher chance of recurrence without chemotherapy. Likewise, your triple negative breast cancers are probably your most aggressive, fast-growing, high-risk breast cancers that almost always need to see chemotherapy, barring very few exceptions. When we talk about chemotherapy before surgery, this is what we call neoadjuvant therapy. This is an important new aspect in the treatment of breast cancer. When you know somebody is going to need chemotherapy and you know what kind of chemotherapy they're going to need, there are huge options and advantages to treating before surgery. The categories that we know would benefit from neoadjuvant chemotherapy include triple negative breast cancer, HER2 new positive breast cancer, and occasionally will include hormone receptor positive breast cancers if they're very large with multiple bulky involved lymph nodes and there might be some advantage to downstaging these cancers. When we talk about the reason for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, there are multiple advantages. First of all, we can downstage, meaning shrink the size of the cancer, reduce the number of involved lymph nodes, making surgery much easier and potentially changing what might be a mastectomy to a lumpectomy or breast conserving therapy if the cancer shrinks enough. The next advantage is when you think about the reason for chemotherapy, primarily it is to get drugs into the bloodstream, expose the body to chemotherapy in the event that any cancer cells have gotten into the bloodstream prior to initiation of chemotherapy and prior to surgery. So the faster you're able to expose someone to chemotherapy, theoretically, the more likely you are to reduce the risk of this cancer showing up somewhere else in the body in the future. Equally important is prognosis. If you see a very aggressive breast cancer melt away with chemotherapy, most of the time this indicates a better prognosis. And probably the most important reason for neoadjuvant or preoperative chemotherapy is to determine whether there would be a benefit to different treatment after surgery. And I'm going to talk to some specifics about that in just a second. Let's focus a little bit on triple negative breast cancer. So again, triple negative breast cancer, you know you're going to need chemotherapy. If you know what kind of chemotherapy and you can go ahead and start chemotherapy before surgery, again, the hope is that we're going to reduce the risk of this cancer coming back somewhere outside of the breast in the future, and that hopefully we will downstage and maybe even render you disease-free before surgery. The most important aspect of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and triple negative breast cancer is obtaining what we call a pathologic complete response, which means that at the time of surgery, there is no disease remaining. The number of cycles of chemotherapy, the type of chemotherapy, whether it's every two weeks called dose dense therapy or whether it's every three weeks, really depends on the stage of your cancer, your age, your performance status and the like. Just within this past year, there was a recent trial presented at our American Society of Clinical Oncology conference using the addition of immunotherapy 
and Religimab or K-Truda, which you've probably seen on TV, in addition to the more routine chemotherapy. And in some instances, this has been shown to improve on the complete response rate, which would potentially overall improve survival. So this is something new that some people with stage two and three breast cancers that are triple negative may hear about, which has just started this year. Additionally, the role of genetics is very important in a triple negative breast cancer for a couple of reasons. One, in anyone who has an abnormal genetic study, and in particular, the BRCA mutation, BRCA1 or 2, which tends to be more common in triple negative breast cancers, anyone that has this mutation, there is an additional chemotherapy agent called carboplatinum that we usually like to expose you to, which is not always used in triple negative breast cancer. But additionally, it helps with treatment decisions after surgery. So with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you receive all of your chemotherapy and then go to the operating room. After surgery, different treatment options may still be recommended. So if there's absolutely no disease left at the time of surgery or what we call a pathologic complete response, there would be no additional need for any chemotherapy. However, if there is residual disease, then there are two different recommendations that may be uh, So first, if you did have genetics and you did have a BRCA mutation and you have residual disease at the time of surgery, there is a drug called Aloparib, which is specific to BRCA mutations that is used. It's an oral medication. It is recommended for one year following surgery in those patients that still have disease and have a BRCA mutation, it has been shown to overall improve survival. This was another brand new recommendation coming out of our American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting this past June. If you do not have a BRCA mutation but still have disease at the time of surgery, then a different oral chemotherapy drug called Zolota or capecitabine is recommended for six months. It has likewise been shown to improve survival. So just when you think you're done with therapy, you're actually not. I won't talk a whole lot about side effects of chemotherapy. Um, that's a topic for another day. But certainly, the more active people stay, the better off they are. And women tend to do quite well with therapy despite the fact that we keep adding more and more therapy as new studies come out showing more improvement with different additional medications. Now looking at the next category of breast cancer that benefits from preoperative chemotherapy, let's talk a little bit about HER2 new positive breast cancers. So for most patients with a stage two or greater or to new positive breast cancer, preoperative treatment is recommended. Now, one can ask why wouldn't everybody get preoperative treatment? And the answer to that is there is a less aggressive chemotherapy regimen that can be used in stage one disease, but in stage two or greater, more aggressive chemotherapy is often warranted. If you have a stage one cancer, and you're treated preoperatively, you may actually be under treating. So for the most part, most people are treating HER2 new positive breast cancers if they are stage two or greater with preoperative chemotherapy. There may be some role for preoperative therapy in a stage one disease, but this is individualized. The chemotherapy is fairly common chemotherapy used with breast cancer. But the addition of a HER2 targeted therapy is what has overall made a huge difference in the survival of HER2 new positive breast cancer patients. Chemotherapy is given for a finite number of cycles, but the HER2 new targeted agents will continue every three weeks to complete an entire one year of therapy. 
in those patients that are also estrogen and progesterone receptor positive, they will also go on to receive endocrine therapy. Once chemotherapy has completed, everyone goes for surgery. And once surgery is complete, if there is, again, a pathologic complete response or no additional disease seen at the time of surgery, the HER2 new targeted agents continue. However, if there is residual disease at the time of surgery, there is a different HER2 new targeted agent that we recommend switching to as that has been shown to improve survival. Now, turning to hormone receptor positive breast cancer, this tends to be a more favorable cancer, a cancer for which often people do not need chemotherapy. When we look at the role of neoadjuvant or preoperative chemotherapy in the setting of a hormone receptor or to new negative breast cancer, the staging is very important. If somebody presents with a very large lesion, a very uh, an ulcerated lesion, one that involves the skin, uh, a rare type of cancer called inflammatory cancer, or multiple bulky palpable lymph nodes, chemotherapy up front may be beneficial. If someone comes in with a smaller breast cancer that is no no obvious need for chemotherapy. The question is teasing out who needs chemotherapy and who does not. In these situations, with a hormone receptor positive or to new receptor negative breast cancer, surgery is generally recommended first. When one completes surgery, then the question is who needs chemotherapy and who doesn't. There is a test that most of you will hear about, which is very important. It is a study that was done well over 10 years ago that has impacted the way we treat hormone receptor positive breast cancer. This test is called an Oncotype test. And basically this test is strictly for women who have a hormone receptor positive breast cancer, has to be her 2 new negative, is supposed to be less than four centimeters, less than three or four involved lymph nodes, the sole purpose of this study is to predict the benefit of chemotherapy. This test is a genetic based study and it runs your cancer cells through a panel of 21 different genes. It can either be done from the surgical specimen or from the initial biopsy and it comes up with a recurrent score. This score will tell you whether or not you benefit from chemotherapy. In anyone with a score of greater than 25, you benefit from chemotherapy. If the score is less than 25 and you're over the age of 50, there's no added benefit. If your score is 21 to 25 and you are under the age of 50, there is still a benefit to chemotherapy. So this study has spared probably 25% of women who otherwise might have received chemotherapy has spared them from receiving chemotherapy. Additionally, several women, approximately 40% that otherwise would not have been recommended to have chemotherapy with this Oncotype test has been shown to benefit from chemotherapy and thereby this test has definitely saved lives. Let me turn a little bit to endocrine therapy. So some types of breast cancer are affected by hormones like estrogen and progesterone. The breast cancer cells have receptors that are proteins that attach to estrogen and progesterone and help them grow. The treatments that stop these hormones from attaching to the receptors are called hormones or endocrine therapy. Tamoxifen is one of the oldest therapies that has been out there and it works by blocking the estrogen receptors on cancer cells. It stops the estrogen from connecting to the cancer cells that tells them to grow and divide. 
Now, tamoxifen will act like an anti-estrogen in breast cells, but it has estrogen qualities in other tissues, such as the uterus and the bones. Because of this, it's called a CERM, or a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It is used to treat women that are either postmenopausal or menopausal. The side effects of tamoxifen can include hot flashes and vaginal dryness or discharge. If a woman has gone through menopause, these CIRMs can actually increase their risk of causing uterine cancer, although that is a very uncommon risk. It also can uncommonly cause blood clots. Depending on the woman's menopausal status, tamoxifen can have different effects in the bone. So for instance, in premenopausal women, tamoxifen can actually cause some bone thinning, but in postmenopausal women, it can often strengthen the bones to some degree. The benefit of taking the hormone therapy or endocrine therapy reliably, certainly any of the risks are outweighed by the benefits. The other category of drugs, which is a little bit newer, are called aromatase inhibitors. We have three different types of aromatase inhibitors, and they're listed here, Arimidex, Fumara, and Aromacin. Most people will see either the Arimidex or Fumara. Aromatase inhibitors are drugs that will stop your estrogen production. So before menopause, estrogen is made by the ovaries, but in women who have gone through menopause or their ovaries are no longer working, a small amount of estrogen is still made in our fat tissue by an enzyme called aromatase. Aromatase inhibitors work by blocking that aromatase enzyme from making estrogen. It's a little diagram. The side effects of the aromatase inhibitors uh, again, they can rarely cause blood clots. They don't have any effect on the uterus, but it can cause muscle pain or joint stiffness. Um, the pain can feel like having arthritis. Um, sometimes switching to a different aromatase inhibitor may help this side effect. We also have different medications that can be utilized to help these side effects. Because the aromatase inhibitors lower the estrogen levels in women after menopause, they can also lead to bone thinning or osteoporosis and even fractures. The duration of endocrine therapy is something that has changed over the years. The initial studies well over 25 to 30 years ago compared two years to five years and five years was considerably better. So that has always been the standard of care. More recently, there have been a couple of trials looking at what we call extended endocrine therapy beyond five years for some postmenopausal women. The optimal duration is not clear. There was a trial looking at 10 years and it appeared to be better than five years. And then there was another trial that appeared that eight years was every bit as good as 10. So when we talk about extending endocrine therapy, we're talking about anywhere between seven and 10 years. This is generally recommended for those who had a more aggressive breast cancer, such as a stage two or three cancer, and those who are tolerating therapy. The risk of developing distant recurrence or metastases following five years of adjuvant endocrine therapy continues to improve for the next 15 years, which provides additional uh, rationale to consider extending the endocrine therapy. There is another genomic study similar to the Oncotype test called Breast Cancer Index, which was just approved within the last one to two years. Uh, this test is solely uh, to provide information on whether your particular cancer may benefit from extending the endocrine therapy. So this is another genomic test that takes your cancer cells and runs it through a panel of different genes. It comes up with information as to whether or not you would benefit from extending your endocrine therapy. This test will help to avoid overtreating women who may not benefit, but would also help provide some improvement in survival for those women who may benefit from extending their endocrine. 
This test is not recommended for all, but for some, it is not recommended for HER2 new positive breast cancer patients. It's only recommended in hormone receptor positive HER2 new receptor negative patients. I want to talk a little bit about the role of Zometa. Zometa is a bisphosphonate. If you've heard of drugs like Fosamax, which are used to treat osteoporosis, Zometa is in the same category as Fosamax, but this is an IV medication. So this is an IV medication that is also called reclassed when it's given in a slightly higher dose once a year to treat osteoporosis. There have been a number of trials in the last 10 years that have looked at the role of Zometa in early stage breast cancer. There have been two positive trials that have used Zometa, which again is an IV injection, once every six months for a total of three years. And it has been found to reduce the risk of breast cancer recurring in the bones. Hormone receptor positive breast cancer, one of the more favorite places to recur is in the bone. With the addition of Zometa, it has been shown to reduce the risk of bony recurrence in almost 30% of women with hormone receptor positive high risk breast cancer. This is currently a recommendation for hormone receptor positive postmenopausal women that had high enough risk cancer that warranted chemotherapy. We're not entirely sure the mechanism, but it seems to do something to the microenvironment of the bone that makes it hostile for cancer cells to occur. Additionally, what we're doing is treating osteopenia or osteoporosis, so it helps to reduce some of the side effects that we're seeing with our endocrine therapy. So this is a new-ish recommendation as well. When we talk about survivorship, this is a hard topic. Life after breast cancer, we like to think goes on as, as normal life goes on, but we all know that there are a lot of issues that can occur. Postmenopausal symptoms are not insignificant. And unfortunately, the best treatment for symptoms is hormones. Of course, having had a diagnosis of breast cancer, hormones are contraindicated. Um, so we have multiple different ways to treat menopausal symptoms. People ask, you know, how am I followed? Do I need to have CAT scans? And the answer is no. There is no role for routine imaging in breast cancer, barring any change in your exam, any abnormal blood work, or any symptoms that are concerning. Blood work we obtain generally uh, once or twice a year in people who remain on some form of endocrine therapy, but there is no magical blood test that helps us to know if your cancer is back. There are some tumor markers that some of you may have heard about, CA-15-3, CA-27-29, sometimes a CEA level, but these are not used for follow-up. These are tests that are used more commonly in women who have metastatic disease and we're using these lab values to help track whether people are responding to therapy. There's lymphedema clinic for those who develop some swelling in their arms. There are support groups. Um, there's a lot that can be offered in this setting of post-cancer care. This is only a little piece of breast cancer. We didn't touch at all on treatment in the setting of metastatic disease. We didn't touch on the side effects of chemotherapy, things that can certainly be considered for another day. I will tell you that as a oncologist who treats an awful lot of breast cancer, this is an exciting time to be an oncologist. There is so much research in breast cancer. There are new things that come out every year. You can see from what I just presented, there were two or three practice changing presentations just this past year, which have changed the way we treat cancer. Even in the setting of metastatic breast cancer, while we're not curing stage four or metastatic disease, we have found ways to keep people alive with an excellent quality of life 
almost turning this into a chronic disease for some, not all. So it's a very exciting time to be an oncologist. And my hope is always that the longer we keep looking, that some of these cancers that today are incurable may be curable tomorrow. I hope this has provided you with some information that will help you on going forward. Um, I work at Blue Ridge Cancer Care and I'm always available and happy to answer questions if I can. Um, some of the websites that are helpful um, include NCC and guidelines. Uh, Up-to-date websites have uh, a section just for patients, a section for doctors, um, Googling can be helpful. WebMD can sometimes be helpful, but be cautious because not all cancer is created equally. We're all hardwired differently. One person's cancer is completely different than your neighbor's cancer. The way you tolerate drugs may be completely different than somebody else does. So be cautious with your Google searches and always make sure to ask your doctor any questions you have. Thank you. Done. Okay, so all I did was push stop recording. Okay. Now I don't know what to do from there. All right.